Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Matt Norkunis. I'm the CFO of Somalogic. I have a bit of an unusual career trajectory. I'm a physician by training. Uh, I went to Wall Street for a while. And now, as the CFO of Somalogic, I have uh, met a number of very interesting, impressive people along the way. Some of you are probably thinking you would want to come and audit our books now that you understand that you have a physician in control of a financial system, but that's a different story. Uh, Larry is actually one of the people that I've met along the way who is uh, truly an impressive innovator, but our next speaker is also uh, one of those really impressive innovators. And just to kind of give you some background, uh, Dr. Shinazi has been working on HIV, hepatitis C, and hepatitis B his whole career. Forty years ago, all three of those diseases, if you were given that diagnosis, were uh, essentially death sentences, untreatable, um, and really just kind of waiting out the time before you died. Where we got to today in the last 40 years of his work is that HIV is a very treatable, manageable disease for anybody who has the disease. Hepatitis C is now curable. And he has been the driver of essentially all of the drugs that have done that. 94% of the world's HIV population is on one of his drugs. And he is also responsible for sofosbuvir, known as Sivaldi or Har Harvoni, which is the hepatitis C cure, which has now made hepatitis C curing similar to taking an antibiotic for a sore throat, strep throat. Uh, 98 plus percent cure rates, no side effects, 8 to 12 weeks. And while he was not responsible for any of the pricing noise that some of you probably know about that, uh, it's the intersection of science and business that he sits at, which allows for the innovation that he has produced in the world, and the $525 million worth of royalties that has gone back to Emory in his name now supports 550 uh, scientists who work on HIV, Hep C, and Hep B moving forward. And so it gives you an idea of the scale of the impact that he's had in the world of virology. And so. Without further ado, I would like to introduce my Cabo San Lucas fishing buddy and world-class virologist, Dr. Raymond Shinazi. Thank you, Matt. That's a wonderful introduction. I really appreciate that. I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, this afternoon to listen to the talks. I really enjoyed Dr. Shapiro's talk. It was very inspiring. I think my only connections with him is that I started my career as a phytochemist, trying to find drugs in plants. So there's some similarities, but that's where it goes. But a lot of the drugs, actually very successful drugs, came from plants very early on, not that much today. But they certainly, some of the classes of compounds I'm going to talk about are nucleosides. Although it's not agriculture like you know it, but it's certainly agriculture from sponges in the sea. That's where some of the drugs like RSC, for example, uh, cytosine or abinocyte, which is a nucleoside, came from. So I'm an expert in nucleoside chemistry and biology, and that's what I do for a living. But I diverse a little bit sometimes. I'm not an excellent uh, speaker, but I hope um, some of the other speakers speak much better than I, think, than I can, because I, actually English is not my first language. I speak four languages, but English is one of my languages, not perfect. But uh, what I wanted to say is that I had the great honor of hearing about Larry for many years, but never met him until two, two years ago. And he wanted to meet me, and I said, well, Colorado, nice place, but it's very high up and I can't breathe very well. Uh, why don't you come and see me? I'm going on vacation. Cabo San Lucas is my favorite place in the world. Come over and we'll have some, a good time together. So he, he agreed and he came with his entourage, the CEO, the former CEO, and, and uh, we basically had a great time. But what I didn't realize is that he always wears black. So I had to do something about this. So as soon as he arrived, we changed his color to this. <laughs> And then I also realized he wanted to go fishing. So I said, well, you know, have you done any fishing before? He said, no, I don't know anything about fishing. So he went out, of course, uh, courtesy. I'm born in the Middle East, so we let the guests go first. And uh, I let Larry try and catch the first fish. And he actually did get a fish. 
eventually, about this size. And he was as happy as a five-year-old. You can imagine, amazing. It's the first time he ever caught a fish. So we're teaching him about fishing, because I think it's important in life to learn how to fish. It's like learning how to gamble, too, because we, are, we won the lottery being alive and being here. But clearly, it was, it's a way, you know, throw the bait in, and hopefully the fish likes the bait, and you get a big tuna like we see here. But he got a little fish, and then we decided that he thought he could take it home and have dinner with this, but it didn't happen. So we actually cut up his, his fish and used it as bait, and we were able to get all these other uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful fish that we ate for the next two days. So we really had a great time. So my talk is, uh, so another thing I learned about him is wow, wow. It's something he likes to say. I never heard anybody say wow, wow until he came along to Cabo. He kept saying wow, wow to everything. The fish was big, the food was great, the beach was great. Uh, and we really uh, had a good time. Every time he saw something interesting on you, he'd say wow, wow. So that was something I learned from him. And I still, I noticed today at lunch, I had some lunch with some of his colleagues, and he, and they actually use Wawa. They work, they work, they work for you, so you've been, you've had an impact on them, obviously. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's interesting, genetic impact, I'm not sure what W-O-W -W means, but some, does mean something, I guess. Uh, so my talk today is about disruptive discoveries on HIV, uh, HCV, and HPV, and I put them in this order because I think we've made a great impact on HIV. We've done an amazing work on HCV, as some of you have heard. And I think the future is now to try and do something for HPV. We've done something before, but we've never been able to cure hepatitis B. And there's a great multitude of people in the world, uh, almost as many people as are hungry in the world who have hepatitis B virus. And it usually goes together. 14% of Africans, for example, have hepatitis B. So it's a huge problem in Africa. It's a whole huge uh, problem in Asia, of course. And it's a huge, it's a smaller problem in the United States, about two million people infected with hepatitis B. And uh, my career really is quite interesting because I started off, as I said, as a chemist, a fight chemist, where I learned chemistry. But I was influenced by a number of people. First and foremost, my mother, who's now 94, still alive with us. And she taught me about the importance of medicines uh, very early, at a very early age. But also the other, amazing uh, woman in my life is my wife was in the audience. And then there was a third lady which came somewhere in the middle. It's Gertrude Elion. And she's, as you know, one, one of the famous women who won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1998. And she said, it's amazing how much you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. And it's a picture of me with her when I was a young man, a bit more hair, a bit thinner. But she was involved in the discovery of acyclovir, another acyclic nucleoside that uh, revolutionized the treatment of, uh, of herpes virus diseases and even herpes encephalitis, which is a deadly disease in children. So I learned a lot from this lady, and I'll tell you, uh, I met her, she actually nurtured me when I was young, younger, a young scientist, still not even assistant professor. And uh, she taught me a few lessons which I hope to teach you today as well, especially the young people in the audience. Thanks to her, in a way, and thanks to my genes, I guess, and thanks to my perseverance, we got about 19 FDA-approved drugs. Uh, I think it's probably a world record for an academic person. Uh, at least five of them I can claim. I was my hands involved when I was inventor of these drugs, Stavidine, D4T, with my old mentor, Bill Prusov, one of the early HIV drugs. Uh, the two most famous ones are 3TC, lamivudine, and emtricitabine, FTC. Then not many people know about LDT, but that's also uh, the only specific drug against hepatitis B virus that I've discovered, although 3TC and FTC were remarkable drugs, because they, not only they had activity against HIV, but they also had activity against hepatitis B virus. And actually, lamivudine was the very first oral treatment for hepatitis B. Before the other one before that was interferon. And then, uh, of course, the most successful drug is Savaldi because it actually cures the disease. And when you think about curing, it's remarkable because this is the first time in history that we have a drug that actually cures a viral disease. And you should remember that also 
approximately 20% or so of the cancers caused in the world are caused by viruses. And hepatitis is actually a deadly disease for a lot of people. It's a slow killer, but it kills hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And clearly, Sovaldi is going to make a difference because people won't need liver transplants anymore if they take the drug early enough uh, before you have uh, heavy-duty fibrosis and eventually leading to liver cancer. So this is a remarkable progress that we made in the last 10 years. Nobody could imagine that we would get to this point. But we knew we could do it, we tried it, and we were successful. And of course, a number of drugs came from, sons and daughters came out from that, and they're listed here. Uh, probably the most uh, commonly uh, used drug today is FTC emtricitabine. Many, about five different, actually seven different drugs came out of FTC that contain FTC cocktails. Single pills, very powerful, that work very well. Also lamivudine, for that matter. So combination chemotherapy is the way to go, obviously. And for viruses, it wasn't that obvious in the early 1990s, I can tell you that, but it is obvious today. I don't know why it took so long. But the words of wisdom for success, in my case, and I'm sure you can add to this list, is what I learned from Gertrude, was know what is wrong with your drug before someone else finds out. So in other words, don't hide the problems. A lot of scientists will hide the problems. They'll, they get in love with their drug, and they shouldn't. They should just find out what's wrong. If you can fix it, fix it. If you can't fix it, throw it away, get another one. You'll see companies spending millions of dollars on something that doesn't really work or hasn't satisfied the criteria that they set out to get, and eventually it fails. And we heard this uh, saying yesterday, if you're going to fail, fail fast. Uh, so it's another way of saying it, aim, aim high and fail cheap. If you're a biotech company, you certainly want to fail cheap because you, have, you can only spend the money once, so you better use it wisely. And the other thing to remember for me, and I've had my fail, I share of failures, I don't much, talk much about them, but you're not, you're not really a failure. It's the drug that fails. And that's something people don't understand. So a lot of the time, if you do a proper clinical, good basic science, good clinical science, good clinical trials, the drug will succeed, but if it doesn't succeed, it's not you. It's a drug that was something you didn't know, you learned from it, and you recycled that knowledge to the next one. And this may be a bit controversial, because I heard somebody yesterday say, well, this morning, I think, you shouldn't do anything. I actually think doing nothing has consequences. I think it's very important to not sit on your behind and do, do something. Even a lot, I've seen a lot of scientists sitting in front of a computer, finding you 20, 30 different reasons why something's not going to work, and ending up doing nothing. It's what you discover on the way that's really important. So get off your butt, and doing nothing has consequences. You can't just sit around doing nothing. And then the last thing I want to teach here is that every drug has its champion. I had, my, I had many times people telling me, the drug I have, even in NIH, many times, I promise you, that didn't fund any of my work on HCV. They didn't fund any of my early work on HIV, just by the way. Okay, but they funded me afterwards, after I made the big discoveries. So you have to have, be a champion, believe in what you do, and that's critical, I think. And then the other thing, of course, I should add here is having good collaborators, because you can't do everything on your own. And I was very fortunate at Emory to find a very smart and very professional chemist. I'm a chemist by training, but I had moved more and more to biology. A gentleman by the name of Dennis Liotan at Emory University, a professor who actually wasn't too, doing too well when I found him. So I asked him if he would work with me to find a way to make some new molecules I had in mind. One of them was what we know today as FTC and 3TC. And I thought most people told me that this is impossible. These compounds, you can see the structure there, it has a carbon with an oxygen and a sulfur and a nitrogen attached. I think uh, you can probably see it better here. Right here, you see the co oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. And they said, this will not be stable. There's no way you can make this compound. It's not possible. Well, guess what? They were wrong. The compound is very stable. Extremely stable because of the ring uh, structure that actually trumps the instability of having an oxygen, an oxygen, and carbon, 
or dioxalane, what we call dioxalane, oxothiolane. Uh, and that really was a turning point where we were able to make, develop synthetic pathways to making literally tons of these molecules for making medicines that save lives. And it went through a circuitous route. That's another problem you get when you are very successful. Your best friends become your lawyers. So I've been deposed many times, and I've been accused of many things. But at the end, if you have good lawyers and you know you're right, you will succeed eventually. So actually, we embarked a lot of litigation, and eventually we freed up the drug and were able to form a company called Triangle Pharmaceutical that developed FTC, and then FTC was eventually sold to Gilead uh, when it was an early phase three clinical trial. So really, that was a, within six months, uh, six months or so, we had an approved drug. So that was really important. But there's also a lot of fundamental science involved in this, in this discovery. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But this is most nucleosides, as you, some of you know, are all what we call the D nucleosides. Amino acid is L. This is the optical rotation. And what we found, probably the most important discovery I ever made in my life, was that the L nucleosides could be active and could be phosphorylated by enzymes. So at the time, nobody thought it was possible. But there were, there were indications that L-nucleosides were found in nature. In fact, L-adenosine is used is the reason why your plants actually grow and go towards the sun. People don't know that. There are L-nucleosides in our own planet. I'm sure some other planet may have everything L. And L was interesting because the, once the L-nucleosides gets into, becomes a chain terminator, especially with a it's like your left hand and your right hand, or the shells, you know, they have left and right. That's the way they go around, they mirror images of each other. But once they get into DNA, incorporated in DNA, this, they're fooled to be taken up. The L-nucleosides, it's very hard to take them off. That's another advantage. In fact, they use that for oligo, oligo, oligo chemistry. Uh, so that's uh, another thing. So as Matt said, I'm not going to spend more time on this, mole on this molecule today. But there is a chemistry behind it. I want to bore you with the chemistry. But it was a fundamentally important discovery at the time. And of course, everybody jumped on it. And we jumped on it because we made several other drugs, which were L-nucleosides. And they turned out to be, in general, less toxic than the D analog. Now, as Matt said, uh, the big reward is saving lives. So my cousin died of HIV in 1990, about the time I filed my patent on FTC. Very sad. And it probably would be alive today if we had this drug available, and especially in combination with AZT, in fact, what we know as Combivir today. But more than 94% of HIV-infected persons today take a combination containing one of our nucleosides. One of the interesting things that we discovered, we discovered, we didn't know at the time, but we knew a lot about the replication cycle of hepatitis B. And so, we wanted to test our drug against hepatitis B. Hepatitis B has a polymerase, uh, reverse transcriptase actually, the latter part of the replication cycle. So at the time, not many people actually tested drugs for hepatitis B. It was very difficult and very costly, but we were able to get some data and demonstrate it for the first time that the L nucleoside could be potentially effective against hepatitis B. So we had basically discovered a, a drug or a stone that could kill two birds at one time. But there are downsides to that as well. I'm not going to go into details on that. So this was really very revolutionary at the time. And of course, you know the rest of history about HIV. We don't have a cure yet, but we're working on that. And again, I won't have time to tell you what the progress has happened in terms of a cure for HIV, but we are working on that. And we've just got an NIH grant at this time. The other important discovery, probably of this century, although the virus was discovered in 1989, uh, is Sovaldi, the Sovaldi, which is the first oral drug for hepatitis C with a very high sustained virological response, which is basically a cure. This is the structure on the left-hand side. I, mean, I don't want to spend time on the, how the drug was discovered. If there's a lot of serendipity was involved in that. It's not trivial molecule, not at all trivial. It took a lot of work. But I think the two most important things was technology that really helped us. 
One is the advent of real-time PCR. And the second point was the work by Ralph Batischlager and Charlie Rice, who actually made something called a replicon, which is a little cell that actually makes uh, our, uh, RNA, uh, HCV RNA. It makes obviously cellular RNA as well, but it makes also the viral RNA. And if you use the two combined, real-time PCR plus the replicon system, cell culture system, you can now test for drugs and find out if your compound block the formation of the viral RNA, but does not affect the cellular RNA. Simple as that. This really, in the early days, uh, interferon was the only choice, and then they added RIBA. You got SVR rates in the 20%, 30% at the most. And this was not adequate because it only worked against certain genotypes. There are six different genotypes for hepatitis C. And the most common one in the United States, and actually in China as well, is the genotype 1. It's 1A and 1B. Um, so interferon actually didn't work very well against, uh, against uh, these, this particular genotype, genotype 1. So that was not very good. And second point, of course, you took drug like interferon, an injectable drug, and you took it for at least a year. A lot of side effects, suicidal thoughts, all sorts of things. And then came some of the newer protease inhibitor, which worked most of the time, but had a lot of side effects. And subsequent to that, Savaldi came along in 2013. And that was the first really truly pan-genotypic uh, nucleoside and actually an antiviral drug for hepatitis C. And then, of course, drugs were combined with it, different drugs with simepriver, for example, which approved the same year and now other drugs, and now we are reaching levels of 96 to 98% SVR, meaning cure. This is not remission, it's a cure. It's not like cancer, don't think cancer here. So it's very, very successful, it has a tremendous impact. And so we can see some of the drugs here on the slide. That's the current landscape, the drugs and the date of approval. And you can see the most recent drug is actually one from AVI. It doesn't contain a nucleoside, but it's only for eight weeks. It has some limitations. Uh, I don't work for any of these companies, just by the way. Uh, so I don't have any conflict of interest with them. Uh, but nucleoside analog are certainly the, the best in class because they're pangenotypic. They have high barrier to resistance. You can get resistance to this, uh, these, some of these uh, protease inhibitors, and some, especially the NS5A inhibitors. And of course, it's low pill burden. We're talking about one single pill a day for 12 weeks or eight weeks, and you get a cure. And this is great, but if you're now going to do all this globally, uh, 12 weeks treatment is a long time. People don't usually adhere to the drug. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And people, are, I believe, are probably overdosed in many, many cases. So. One of the things that we've been trying to do, and we have put some studies into that and some or our own money to develop, was a, what we call an ultra-short modality. Ultra-short because we're talking about three weeks. Still not there, but, but clearly you can combine. There are different drugs that are available out there, NS5A, NS5B, NS5A, NS5B, NNIs, uh, and other and protease inhibitors. So you can eventually make a cocktail that, like we've done for HIV, that could be very, very effective. And everything you've learned about the viral dynamics of HCV is probably wrong. Everything that's been published has been wrong because they use wrong models. And Al Perelson was one of the guys who did that. So if you think outside the box, you, you go ahead and try it, uh, a study. And a lot of people have tried unsuccessfully to go down below four weeks of treatment. This is a summary that was published last year on what has been tried in terms of combination chemotherapy. But the problem is a lot of these drugs are what I would call incestuous. They are used, they're basically the same company using their own drugs, not combining the best possible drugs together. That's another problem, which we'll see in this business. It's a shame, but that's the way life is. Uh, it could be a company like Bristol Myers Squibb has the best NS5A, and Gilead has the best nucleosides, and, and uh, Abvi has the best protease inhibitor, but they, nobody's put them together. But we try to change this. 
So we devised a small study that we did in Hong Kong two year, three years ago. We started it and we finished it and published it in Lancet Gastroenterology last, uh, in, 2000, in the end of 2016. And we actually got 100% SVR within three weeks, DAA triplet therapy. We had a, a Previr, uh, Asvir, and a Buvir drug. And small numbers, you can see the viral kinetics on the left-hand side of the virus. Some look a little bit better than others. But the bottom line is that by week two, the, two of the regimen produced 100% uh, uh, SVR, uh, SVR2, I would say, I, don't know, I, would, I would call it. Uh, but it's not yet, you haven't really cured anything yet, you have to really look long term after you stop therapy, whether the virus rebounds. And actually when you look even further, you see that uh, they all got cured. So that was a proof of principle that actually you could do shorter treatment, at least for genotype 1B, which by the way was the most difficult virus to treat in China and in Asia before with interferon. Now we can treat it for three weeks. Uh, so why give the Chinese 12 weeks of treatment when you can give it for three weeks? Think about it. I mean, unfortunately, the drug companies are pushing these regimens on the Chinese and other countries to give 12 weeks when they don't really need them because the genotype, type, the genotype 1B is probably the easiest today to treat. So that's another reason why we go to Hong Kong and China to do some of these studies. There's more than 40 million people infected with genotype 1B. So we have a lot of people in the world who have genotype 1B. The government, the Chinese government will tell you 10 million. But that's another story. So we've come a long way. Uh, hepatitis C solution is one of the greatest success stories in human medical history, I believe. First time we cure a viral disease. The products are getting better and better, and we've got some great products now and great pangenotypic compounds, but we haven't been able to shorten the treatment. I think shortening the treatment is possible. Nanoparticle, single shot maybe one day. It certainly increases the quality of life. The value is there, unquestionably. The value of it, this drug is unquestionable. It increases life expectancy, and it works. And so I think uh, there are possibilities. And of course, to talk about the global treatment, you have to talk about treatment as prevention will be a powerful tool towards global elimination and eventually eradication. People are now talking the same way as they talked about HIV, which is a much harder um, virus to cure because it, there's latency there. There's a latent form of the virus, whereas for HCV there was no latency. And we have to start thinking about cure rather than treatment or band-aids. Larry, as we get older, we can't just work on treatments. We have to find curative therapies. Uh, and that's what really people should do and think about, and young people need to think about that. So my, my dream eventually is to have a, like we have a ZPAC, why not a CPAC? One, one, one pill given for three days and you can cure the disease. So that's the ultimate, ultimate disruptive goal. I think it's possible. We can certainly jack up the dose of these drugs that we're using. There's no reason if you're going to give a shorter treatment, the safety margin is there. And we just have to find the right combination, the best drugs to put together. I think within one week or less, we can cure hepatitis C everywhere. That's my dream. And I'm going to work on this for a long time, because I don't think the problem of hepatitis C is going to go away, despite what you hear in the press. There's still a lot of people infected. Now, a quick analysis, because some people talk about this, and I think a simple question is, how many pills for global elimination? And you now compare HIV to HCV. If you estimate there are 18 million people under treatment for HIV today, globally, and they take one pill a day for every day they take the pill for the rest of their life, it's basically 6.6 .6 billion pills per year. Now, if you imagine a 12-week regimen, you have about 71 million people infected with HCV. They take one pill a day for 84 pills for 12 weeks, assuming you don't shorten the duration of the treatment, you're talking about 6 billion pills for global elimination. So you can see the value is there. And people complain about the price, I'm not gonna go there. But, you know, certainly the price will come down. You pay, you're willing to pay for HIV, 15 to 19 to 20 thousand dollars a year for the rest of your life, or find a cure. You, you decide. You be the judge. But these drugs really do make a difference. We've seen what it, what's happened with HIV. Here is a beautiful picture, not not so beautiful, of a young man before HIV medicines. 
and when you give the drugs. This is really what the real problem is. And I've seen my cousin look like the guy on the left in the United States, just by the way. And I've seen many patients at, when I worked at the VA sitting outside my room looking at the guy on the left-hand side. So I know what it's like. And I know they don't sit there anymore. So never forget the need for assistance to the developing, developing world. Access to, access to drug is critical. Provides years of quality of life, taking people out of their deathbed, literally. The problem with HCV, it has no visible scars like HIV. You can't see when you, it takes time to kill people. But it does kill eventually. So hopefully we can inspire people and the public to advocate solutions to this problem. And I just want to stop on this and end up with my work on hepatitis B virus, which is my, the one I hope to destroy uh, very soon. For the rest of my time, I'm going to spend on hepatitis B. And now I'm going to put you a bit more science. I'm sorry. I hope my talk has been a bit uh, non-scientific up to now, because I know the audience is a mixed audience, but I would, will go a bit in, more in depth. So quickly for about hepatitis B, it is an epidemic globally. We have vaccine since 1981, but not everybody is vaccinated. There's almost 200 and almost 400 million people estimated chronically infected worldwide. And two thirds of the cases are in poor developing countries. There are drugs available, some of them, I had my hands in them and made them. But what's interesting is even on existing therapies, infected individuals can develop chronic liver disease, liver cirrhosis, and especially hepatocellular carcinoma. So even with the drugs we have. So that's one of the reasons people, when I write a grant, initially I got some pink sheets telling me we don't need a cure for hepatitis B. We already have great drugs. Some of them you invented, Dr. Shinazi, but they're not, you don't need to. Fortunately, things are changing and people understand better the problem. It's a global problem and liver cancer can occur despite having treatment, the treatment just delay. Now, a lot of people are working on this. I'm not the only one. Uh, so everybody, a lot of people have shifted from HIV you know, to some extent, and also especially from HCV. You can't really get a grant for HCV anymore because you know, it's been taken care of. Maybe you get a grant for vaccines, and I still think we need a vaccine for HCV. But HBV cure, a lot of people are working on this. And there are many approaches, some of you are very familiar with, some of the technology, the capsid effectors. That's one area I'm very interested in. CRISPR-Cas, Talens, yes, cRNA, and three inhibitors. Uh, many, many different approaches, therapeutic vaccines, uh, immunological approaches, TLR, agonists. I'm not, not gonna go in details. Each one could take a long time to describe in details. What I wanna talk to you about today is basically capsid effectors, and especially the role in ablating or reducing CCCTNA, which is a form of latent, it's a, it's a mini chromosome, that's finding inside cells which are infected with hepatitis B. And more recent data shows, fortunately for us, and makes me think that it's possible to have a cure for hepatitis B. The half-life was thought to be years, but it turns out to be 10 to 20 weeks, the half-life. So that's not bad, because it means you may have to treat longer than H H H HCV to get a cure. But certainly, it may be possible. It's not a lifetime to get rid of CCDNA. Um, and of course, there's a turnover of the cells, liver cells, which is about a few weeks, uh, infected cells. So it's not affected, the drug, the CCDNA is not, effect, uh, is not affected by current drugs that we have, partially impacted by interferon. And we also have another problem, which is integrated hepatitis B virus. We don't know what the role is, if it's silent or whether it's active, is it like an active vol vol uh, inactive volcano or what. People are debating this. And we can talk about that later. And of course, there's, there's an impaired immune response in most cases. If you can boost the immune system, maybe we can do like we did with cancer with some of the drugs and change things. And existing therapies act only on a few steps in the HPV replication cycle, mostly the polymerase, which is my specialty and my interest. This is what a capsid looks like on the right-hand side. Uh, and when it's when this is the red, the red, uh, red part with the blue, a little bit of blue. When you put a capsid inhibitor, it shifts the capsid, it makes it different. And I'll show you some pictures in a minute. So we think cent the central role of HPV capsid protein in viral replication is the uh, capsid 
because the CAPS is essential for viral replication, many, many uh, things, as you can see the encoding, the viral entry, and so on. HPV capsid uh, assembly effectors inhibit replication. Uh, the nice thing about it, we have at least eight genotypes for hepatitis B, last time I checked. So it works against, the capsid inhibitor should work against all the different uh, serotypes. Effective against nucleoside-resistant virus, which is rare, but possible. Uh, potential synergy with these distinct therapies. And diminish, or uh, the key is to diminish or, or suppress CCDNA levels. I'm going to go through this quickly because I'm running out of time and I don't want to, uh, you to miss your, your break. But we have discovered, I'm showing the structure actually for the second time uh, ever. I presented at the easel, the liver meeting, the structure of this compound on the left-hand side. We filed the patent on this molecule. It's actually quite good because it has a potency of about 3 nanomolar, which is very good. It inhibits HPE secretion. This is all in cell culture, by the way. It also reduces CCDNA amplification. Um, and in vivo, it has a lung stability. In dog and human plasma, it has good stability in liver macrosomes and long half-life. In mice, it's actually much greater than six hours. And this is the potency compared to some of the competitors. There are actually six different capsid effectors in the clinic right now, but I don't think any of, them, any of the compounds that are there are as potent or as good as what we have here. Okay? Uh, so um, this is just data showing you what it does, really. Um, we have a cell system that has a receptor, the known receptor actually discovered by a Chinese called the NTCP receptor for hepatitis B, and we can infect the cells and we can measure different parameters. We can measure HPV DNA, we can measure uh, S antigen, we can measure uh, PG RNA. So all these things can be measured very accurately. And you see the impact uh, our drug has compared to some of the drugs that are available like Integavir. Integavir is a nucleoside and very little impact on uh, these parameters, except for the, of course, the CCDNA. Sometimes, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'll show you some electron, micro, my, my, my electron microscopy. Here we take some HPV capsid, incubate them, and then induce assembly. And we incubate them with the compound and see what happens. And you can see uh, the left hand side is a vehicle. The GLS4 is a competitor drug, which actually was involved in the discovery of that compound too. And then GLP26, which is our drug. Show you a, a blow up. This is what happens to the capsid on the right hand side. It's very visible, very clear that the capsid just opens up like a broken, like a cracked eggshell with this compound. So it's very, very impressive what happens uh, with, these, with these compounds. In the case of our compound, it does something different. It's a different mechanism. And again, you can possibly combine two different capsid inhibitors. We can talk about that. And this actually makes us much smaller capsid. We have a, twin, a very small capsid. It looks like a boiled egg, eggs rather than a cracked egg. And there's fewer of them. So there, are, there is an impact there on the compound. Most important, we have a humanized mouse model. And we can basically, it's a chimeric human liver mouse model, and we can put human liver tissue in it, infect it with hepatitis B, and monitor uh, after a time and measure different parameters. So you have entegavir, which is your control, the GLP26 in a combination, and you can measure, uh, in this case, S antigen as well as viral load. We get a very significant uh, antiviral effect over four log drop in virus. And we also see HPE antigen reduction. The two, I know it's a two mouse, it's a four mouse experiment. Very expensive mice, but they give you very good results. We are repeating this experiment, of course. But clearly, you can see the E antigen dropping in the two animals and then the, uh, with a combination. And also the S antigen, which is remarkable, also, also comes down. So, as far as I know, this is the first time shown for any compound to do. Uh, both these events taking place, as well as, of course, the viral DNA. This summarizes basically the work we've done and the potency of the compound. I mentioned it's a four log inhibitor. It does decrease HPE antigen, HPS antigen. And also, I didn't show you that, but we do see a reduction in CCDNA. And I strongly believe that capsid effectors will be part of any combination uh, therapy in the future or cure therapy. Uh, for, for um, hepatitis B in the, future, in the very near future, because they really do have, using them in combination with 
another modality like siRNA, or especially if you want to clear uh, the virus that in, is integrated as well, uh, because the capsid inhibitor will not do that, but it certainly will knock off uh, the CCC DNA, and, and eventually when the cell dies, you can, uh, once the cell dies, then uh, the virus no longer exists. The key is to prevent new infections of new cells. And by the way, not all cells are infected in the liver of people infected with hepatitis B. So I think in the future, we'll see a lot, we'll hear a lot more about these amazing compounds and how they work and potential use, a bit like we've seen with NS5A inhibitors, which are part of every cocktail today for the treatment of hepatitis C. So going with the philosophy before I end. So there was a Nobel Prize winner, a Frenchman, a French writer, you may know him, André Guide, who said, there are many things that seem impossible, only so long as one does not attempt them. So that's one other thing. And there's a, also, to, because we live in America, I have to talk about a, an American science fiction writer. He said, everything is theoretically impossible until done. I think, in my opinion, I think hepatitis B is curable. We need to mobilize stakeholders, ac academia, to get people to work together and not make the same mistakes we made with HCV. Public health, industry, regulatory agency, government, all involved. We have the tools, I promise you. We need to have the willpower to make this a priority. And I think we will succeed in doing this. To end, I just want to give my collaborators at Emory University, my colleagues, my group, my collaborators at Emory, but also my friends in Hong Kong, my friends in Paris, and of course, I do now have a grant, finally, after this drug was discovered from NIH to fund this work. Thank you very much. <laughs>Thanks, doctor. I was just curious about, um, you know, with uh, hepatitis B, the, um, the, we had a vaccine, um, not a vaccine, immunization for it. And I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about as far as maybe having a vaccine in development, because I know you're treating hepatitis B, but would you have like a vaccine to prevent? In other words, like with um, influenza, every year you, you get another shot from influenza, but it's, it's the same influenza, it's just from year to year it, it mutates, so then you're fighting the mutated form the following year, and they're telling you you should still get the, the new you know, vaccine because it'll help you reduce symptoms, but you never really get into the core of fighting the virus itself. So I was just kind of curious if you had anything that works well, for that. Well, there certainly Thank are immunological approaches that are being developed, I mentioned some of them. But fortunately, most DNA viruses, they can be cured. What a great example is smallpox, I mean, with vaccine. I mean, it's a remarkable event that took Polio is probably next. Uh, and I think hepatitis C is, with RNA, RNA virus is much more difficult. You can actually cure it with drugs. Hepatitis B is certainly possible. The vaccine works very effectively. Uh, there are newer vaccines. Instead of taking three injections, you take two injections and so on. It's the vaccine we have is, a, is amazing. It lasts a lifetime, basically. So it's it provided you, provide you can check your blood that after taking the vaccine that you are, have antibodies towards it. So it works very, very well. Uh, but there are, there are an additional immunological approaches, and I think some of these capsid effectors, when we start using them, you'll see the immune system uh, clearing some of the virus as well. Larry, to the front. I think I want to ask a related question. In, with, when Solvaldi cures hepatitis C, is, are there data that say that the people that were cured have, in fact, been vaccinated because their immune system did that to help clear the virus? No, they're not cured. They're not cured. They can be reinfected. It's a bit like herpes. If you had a cure for herpes virus, I mean, an, an experiment like it was done with herpes many years ago, when there wasn't all the paperwork that we have to do today for human studies, uh, you can infect yourself with herpes here, and then it, and it will take, obviously, the infection and infect yourself here, and it, it will also take. I wouldn't recommend you doing it, but I'm just saying it's possible. It's been published, actually, in the old days, back in the 40s or whatever. Uh, so I'm just saying uh, there's no 
I don't, there's no protection. That's why I think we still need a vaccine. Uh, and people are working on this. We'll get some results towards the end of this year. Uh, a lady who's working at Johns Hopkins is working on this, Andrea, and hopefully uh, Andrea Cox. Uh, you should invite her next, next year, maybe talk about it. But she certainly is a lead, the leader in this area. And I think, I think it's definitely needed. One more question, if there's one out there. The gentleman, right? I was wondering about uh, the mechanism of action of your capsid inhibitor or how, um, whether you did any structural work that guided uh, that. Well, uh, we've done, the, the only thing we've done is the electron microscopy at this stage. We are doing the crystallography. Uh, that's going to come next, but we've not done it yet. But I've, a lot of work has been done in Indianapolis on similar compounds. Uh, another competing company called Assembly. They've done a lot of structural work on capsid inhibitors. So we, we, know, uh, we know how they usually work. But what's exciting about our compounds is the potential of using it in combination with other capsid inhibitors. And, and we know also about resistance, by the way. We know that our compound has different profile from some of the other competitors. But that's fine. You know, it's nice to have competition. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, we really need good clinical studies. Unfortunately, a lot of people are very, don't show the structures of the compounds. They don't show the data at meetings. You should insist people come here to talk to present their data. If they have data, they should show the structures of compounds. They're so cagey about it. They're so afraid somebody's going to copy them. Uh, and even the data, the clinical data, you get bits. You get basically salami. You get a little talk here, a little talk there, a little bit talk there. And it, you, know, you never get enough, frankly. So clearly, we need more openness to, get, to be successful. I mean, once you file your patent, what are people going to do? I mean, eventually, you're successful. You're going to have litigation anyway. So be ready for that. That's going to happen. So somebody's going to come out of the woodwork and claim that it's theirs. That happens all the time. But get ready. I mean, there's nothing to hide, really. Unfortunately, a lot of scientists still in industry as well as academia hide, uh, don't show things that they should be showing so they can learn from each other and, and move faster. So I think next year we'll see a lot more data coming out on these capsid inhibitors, especially the ones who failed. But there is one drug that uh, J&J is developing. It was a company they bought out about a couple of years ago. And they had a compound, a capsid inhibitor. To, to this day, we don't know what the structure is. And the drug has been through clinical trials. Believe of course, they investigators know the structure, and FDA knows. But I don't know what the structure is. So we'll see. OK, let's thank Dr. Shinazi. Thank you.